She is an internationally recognized employment and human rights partner with governments. She has worked with employers of all sizes in ensuring that agreements, policies, and workplace practices are legally compliant. She is a popular lecturer and teacher and has spoken at events hosted by the International Bar Association, Canadian Bar Association, the Advocate Society, the Law Society of Upper Canada, and the Human Resources Professionals of Ontario. She also handles complex civil litigation at all levels in courts and appears frequently in front of Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, the Canada Labour Board, and the Canadian Human Rights Commission. She's a thinker, speaker, writer, and MC par excellence. Please help me welcome Nina. So, um, thanks very much, Lily. So, when, when Helen was talking, just so you know, I am your classic lawyer, extrovert, sensory, thinker, judgmental. Not very good on the touchy-feely stuff, but I'm working on it, right? You need to know what you're good at, and you need to work on the stuff you're not so good at. Um, when Lolit asked me to speak, the one thought that got through my head was, he wants me to put three years of law school in an hour, so that's what I'm going to do. I am not going to try to make you become lawyers. I want you to be able to identify when you might need a lawyer, when an issue might arise, when you need advice. Just like I don't, you know, <clears throat> my electrician does not make me become an electrician, but I have a fair idea that when the lights don't work, I should call one. It's the same thing with you. You need to know when you need to worry about a lawyer. And I call this session Dreams, Myths, and Nightmares because I work a lot with entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs, even if they are extroverts and sensory and thinkers and all that stuff, are dreamers. They dream of doing something differently than what exists today. They dream of captaining their own ship. They dream of not being in a corporate Canada or a corporate U.S. doing things the way they've been told to do it. Rather, they want to do something different. And it may sound weird, but I, as a lawyer, want to support your dreams. But I am constantly surprised with the myths that are out there about how you do things. And a lot of those myths are very much myths about what laws exist, what is legally enforceable, and what is not legally enforceable. And as a litigation lawyer, uh, that I do simple litigation, and I do complex litigation, I do employment litigation, I can tell you, although that's how I make my money, so it's good for me, for the people who are involved, for the business people involved, litigation is a nightmare. It is counterproductive, it is expensive, it detracts from your attention from what you want to do. And it ruins your dream. So what I'm trying to do today is teach you a little bit about what you need to know when you need a lawyer and trying to avoid common pitfalls because you might be working under some common misapprehensions. Now, I'm admitted to the bar in Ontario, so I'm really going to focus on Ontario law. I know that we do have some guests over the internet, and what I will say is much of what I'm going to say to you applies in your jurisdiction as well, even though the specific laws may have some variations. So the first thing, myth, I love this myth. I'm in Waterloo, we have all sorts of startups. We get lots of young, bright, brilliant people, many of whom right out of university or while they're still in university, come up with a great idea, work together, and the first myth is we're only a small startup, the law doesn't really apply to us. That one, wrong, okay? There is no exemption in any legislation that really matters to a business which exempts you because you're little, young, tiny, naive, or inexperienced. One of the things that we learn in law school is that ignorance of the law is no excuse. But that is really used in the criminal code context. What's really sad is in the business context, ignorance of the law can cost you, and it can cost you your dream. So myth number one, I want you, the law does apply. All of the laws, the same laws, whether it's employment law or intellectual property that applies to Coca-Cola, LTD, applies to you, all right? Now, 
Some of it may not yet be applicable because you're not at that stage yet, but you're not exempt just because you're little. So one of the things that I hear about is we don't have to obey the employment standards because we're little. And this is a scenario that I get. A whole bunch of university students come up with a great business idea, and they're going to get all their buddies to work for free to develop this idea, and then they're going to make oodles and oodles of money, and then they're going to figure it out later. This is not a good legal or business plan. Because more than likely, some of those friends or young people or buddies who are working together on this great idea will be deemed to be employees. Now, owners arguably are exempt from parts of the employment standards legislation. But your CEO, president, and treasurer, or your chief technical officer, or your chief research and development person, or your brilliant R&D guy are not exempt from employment standards. And different standards are in different jurisdictions. This goes to, you know, I'm speaking about Ontario, but if you're in BC or Arkansas or Kansas, there could be different rules. So you have to remember, how are you going to deal with employment standards? So you think you don't care. Now, I don't know if Helen got into this, but a lot of entrepreneurs will work for free for two years. This is not unusual. Or they'll do some kind of job in the daytime to subsidize their real passion, which is this baby that they are bringing into being. You can do that as an owner. As an owner, you can work 80 hours a week. As an owner, you can ignore um, minimum wage laws, vacation laws, statutory holidays, etc., etc. Can't do that when you have employees. So, the basic rules in Ontario that you got to know. <coughs> Minimum wage laws, 10, 25 an hour. So my young entrepreneurial group who thinks they can get, oh, I'll get my buddies to work for free in a case of beer and they'll be really happy, don't do it. Figure out how you're gonna deal with that if they're working for you, or be honest, make them owners. If they're going to put in sweat equity, then maybe recognize that in some kind of ownership structure. Don't exploit people just because they share your dream and forget that they need to be paid too. There's that pesky law about overtime, 44 hours a week. I don't know a single successful entrepreneur that only works 44 hours a week. I just don't. Maybe after they become successful, they can slow down. But usually what happens is they find another passion, sort of working 80 hours a week on their next baby. But successful entrepreneurs often work more than 44 hours a week, and they often expect the people around them to work the same long hours that they do. All right? Now, culturally that may not work. If you're an owner, you might want to pay, put in 80 hours a week. If you hired somebody, they may have different expectations. And overtime kicks in over 44 hours. We also have hours of work legislation, which are constantly <coughs> ignored by entrepreneurs. Eight hours a day, 40 hours, there's a bit of flexibility. But 48 is kind of a one threshold, 60 is another some flexibility, but you've got to know that there are hours of work. There's some legitimate ways to get around it in writing, but you need to do that. Two weeks paid vacation. I know an entrepreneur that's worked 80 hour, uh, hours a week. He hasn't taken a single day off. Not a single day. Not, not, not like I, I think Christmas Day was the last day he took off. So that's really not going to work with the staff holiday and the two week paid vacation. So one of the morals of the story is your employees, and it's not unusual, Sometimes we'll get work in better conditions than you have yourself. Now, if you want people to work those eight-hour weeks and have the same passion, you probably have to figure out how to make them owners. You've got to share the baby. And sharing the baby is very tough to do for entrepreneurs. Now, there are exemptions. There are some. They're not complete exemptions. There are some exemptions for managers and supervisors. There's some exemptions for IT professionals usually at the higher level. Um, there's some exemptions for minimum wage laws for interns, but usually, you know, you can't, I had this great scheme suggested to me that we'll just, you know, call everybody an intern and they can work forever for free. It, it's probably not gonna pass Ministry of Labor uh, guidelines. But the types of internships we're thinking of are internships through university, college, or high school or for not-for-profit organization, primarily those that are helping young immigrants, people with disabilities, or people who are re-entering the marketplace, 
uh, get some job experience. Making all your friends unpaid interns may work for a while because lots of things are done on a daily basis that are not complying with the law. It is a good thing that there were no police officers watching me drive after I got past the accident. But what happens is these laws matter when there's a falling out. All right, and there will, you really have to know that there may be a falling out. That dream team that you put together, something may happen, and then there's a falling out, and somebody goes and says, well, I never got paid for that, and they go to a smart lawyer, like me, or a few of my other colleagues, who will figure out all sorts of ways of making your life miserable. And there is no exemption, by the way, because we're a startup working together. That, I, I looked for that exemption. I really have, because it almost ought to be an exemption for, to encourage startups and there is not. Okay, so there you go. So, you can try the we're small so we'll pay when we can, we're small we we'll pay later. Just know that you're taking a compliance risk. Just like my driving fast might have been a slight compliance risk. You may want to try to take a compliance risk, but don't look at me to tell you that it's risk free, because it's not. The underlying expectation of a Canadian employee is that people will be paid on some regular basis. And there is some room for deferral. There are things we can do. But it is a deferral, which means that you do have a debt, which means that you have to pay it. And the one thing that should scare you in this jurisdiction is directors and directors are personally liable. Remember this. This is the only thing you remember. Directors are personally liable for unpaid wages <coughs> an unpaid vacation pay, okay? Personally liable, okay? So that means that you can have this wonderful startup where you all work together and you all love each other and you share this dream together because you're the Helen Jowett dream team put together and your Myers-Briggs all match up and the stars all align and then one guy gets annoyed at you and they can sue you and it's not just a company suit, it is a personal suit at that point. I like this one. This is the one I get, yes? The overtime pay, if it's a professional, it's a straight down, right? It's no, not all professionals are exempt. So you have to look and check whether your profession is exempt. And for example, I often get, well, engineers are exempt. But when you look at the legislation, it's not all engineers. It's professional engineers who are exempt. There are many engineers here, probably in this room today, who are not working at, are not PNGs, or not working in a PNG capacity. So be very careful. Call, there's a ministry toll free line if you want to ask or call a lawyer. Do not assume that because you are a professional that you are exempt, okay? It's only certain kinds of professionals. So you can exploit your law students and lawyers all you want because they're exempt. So that, that one's a good one. So I, I often joke with my law students and articling students that they don't have any protection of the Employment Standards Act because supposedly they're professionals, but be very careful. Um, now, this is the one, ah, we don't need anybody for lawyers. You know, lawyers, we're just tedious, we're just we do formalities, we're too expensive. We're just so excited to be working together. We'll be working it when, we're, when we make it big. Okay? I've heard this, honestly. This is like almost, it's about three people have put their coats together as to why they don't mean so wrong. I love these people though, because what happens is they get involved in litigation, and the litigation is like 15 times more expensive than doing it right in the first place, and therefore we make lots more money on it, but it's not really what you want to do, and quite frankly, it's not really what I want you to do either. Okay. And here's where the problems start to occur. You know, we talked about people who share your vision and your mission and your brand. But I find where the problems and the friction occur is where people have different unwritten expectations of what they're getting out of it. You may well have a person who's willing to work 60 hours a week. You may have a person who may be willing to be undercompensated because they think they're, you know, building something for themselves. And they may say, I'm going to get a share of this company when it goes public. I'm going to be a director, I'm going to get a bonus, I'm here for the long term, and I'm going to get paid when we get an investor. And meanwhile, you may not actually see that person as that key, right? So those are kind of sometimes where the friction points occur. Because what happens when you get an investor, and you don't share the wealth in the way that that person who put in the 60 hours a week feels is appropriate, they're going to be very unhappy. 
And what happens when people are unhappy? So, I'm not happy anymore. Okay, so I'm not happy anymore. What do they do? Well, this idea is my idea too. I own it too. I'm just going to take it elsewhere. All right? So, later on in the presentation, you don't think this is going to happen? Well, both, I wonder if anybody remembers Puma brand. Does anybody remember Puma brand? Some of the older, yeah, but some of the, okay, some of the people. Well, Puma was founded by Rudolf Dessler. And does anybody remember Adidas? Was far, yeah, so Adidas, you guys, come on, come on. Somebody has to watch TSN here. Okay, Adolf Dessler, right? Adidas. So two brothers share a vision, and then they don't get along. You know, that Cain and Abel thing happens everywhere. And one of them goes and opens a competitive business. This was probably not the best thing for Adidas at the time. Okay? So another thing can happen is they can go to another competitor of yours and say, well, you know, Remember, you didn't do any formalities. Lawyers are tedious formalities. So, you know, we all love each other. We don't need a financial agreement. Let's just get married. Let's just live together. Let's be ha live happily together. Bad idea for family law and a bad idea for employment law. So here, this person who's unhappy is going to go to the CEO. Or they can say, I didn't get the shares well as I deserve ideas and egos. And you actually needed that person, and they're gone. And the fourth possibility, I didn't put in there because I was being nice, but I don't feel nice late and the drive here was horrendous, is you get into an expensive lawsuit because you're going to actually sue this person so that you can keep your baby out of the hands of the competitor, or they're going to sue you for all the back pay and bonus and commission that they think they ought to have gotten. So this is not good. Oh, I love this one. This is another quote. We're an amazing team. We have such chemistry. We've known each other since high school. Nothing will ever separate us. Together, we're going to take on the world. So this is my synopsis of it. Does that remind you, anybody a techie here? Who's got a Mac computer? Who's got an iPod or an iPad? Does anybody remember Steve Wozniak? Okay. And Steve Jobs, the two Steves, the Silicon Valley, the ones who created that Mac computer that you started with was 512 K memory, like I, I think my daughter's Nintendo has more than that, right? So things do happen. People who were the dream team, and, and Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs were a dream team, do split up, and it could be all sorts of reasons. <coughs> Personal ambitions change. You know, one person could have made a million dollars, and they want to go to Fiji and live on a beach. The other person might want to make a hundred million dollars. Health and disability. You know, you've heard the old adage, if you've got your health, you've got everything. But, you know, you can't control always when people get a heart attack or they get cancer. Somebody gets married, possibly to someone you like, possibly to somebody you can't stand. And they get divorced, which is even worse, trust me on this. Or they have children and they want to spend more time with their children. Or, you know what, it could be just like a great marriage that turns sour. When we were in the car together, we were talking about friends of mine who I thought outwardly were the perfect couple and they recently split up, and we're all trying to figure out, well, why did that happen? It happens in business, too. And nobody knows why those marriages split up. Nobody all knows why the Wozniaks and Jobs couldn't keep going. But the reality is things change, and you need to plan for it. And that's what we do. We lawyers, we know all the rotten things that can happen to you, and we write really great paperwork. And if you're lucky, it's sort of like a great marriage. You write that prenuptial, you put it in the safe, you get married, and you die when you're 88 making passionate love to each other. However, the likelihood is it's probably not going to happen, and at one point in time, you might be grateful for the prenuptial agreement. Okay, if you don't believe me, I've told you about Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, Adolf and uh, Rudolf Dessler, and you know, from I know there's a large Indian expat community here, the Ambani brothers, and they were supposedly going to work together and be the next generation of Reliance. And now we have two Reliances suing each other, and the lawyers are getting rich. It happens in India. It's great. All right. So that's why my written agreements matter. It's not because we're expensive, not because we're tedious, not because we're naysayers. It's not because we only see the negative. It's because we're realists. And dreamers and realists don't always get along, but you've got to trust me, it's worth it. So, I can't give you all three years of law school in an hour, but I just wanted to highlight some of the things we try to do in employment agreements, shareholder agreements, and intellectual property agreements. And you should have those. And it's kind of like your core 
basic agreements that every business should have. So I don't have time necessarily, so I wanted to take some time for questions. But the first thing you need to think about is, okay, what are the business terms? And people always say, well, business terms are easy. But I find when I'm drafting it, the business terms aren't as easy because people, again, have these unwritten expectations. And when you're trying to put it down in writing, it forces you to focus your mind on what actually you are prepared to give to your dream candidate to make him or her part of your team. So what, are you, what title are you willing? Who's he, going to re he or she going to report to? Um, what exactly are you expecting? This is one that really takes some time. You know, I'm not saying you're going to have a job description that's going to be cast in stone. It doesn't work with a startup. But you should have some realistic expectations. Hiring a chief executive officer, for example, and expecting that person to be the chief cook and bottle washer is not a very good use of that person's time. So think about what you're expecting that person to do. Pay is a really good one. You have, you have to be honest, you're not probably going to be able to pay as well as an established competitor, but there may be things that you're able to do in terms of bonus and commission, and in terms of ownership, in terms of equity, shares, and so This can get very complicated. I mean, there are literally um, you know, courses on how to design incentive compensation. But the point is, you need to be honest about what you're willing to give up to get somebody good. And it's not really giving up, because what you're really doing is saying, I need this team member. There are things I can do alone, but with a partner, I can do so much more. So you're looking to grow the pie together. To grow the pie together, you're willing to sort of incentivize this person by putting together an attractive set of business terms. OK, I hate so I call them the divorce terms. Well, what happens if, at some point in time, things go a bit sour? What happens if you're Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. And what's interesting, that one didn't lead to litigation, which tells me they had claimed for it. And what probably tells me is when they first got their first investment, their investors told them to plan for it. Because that's one thing we want to see when we invest in a company. So how much compensation? Now, people are surprised how generous Ontario courts are to employees. So I thought it would be good for you to know that there are cases where somebody has worked two or three months, been an absolute disaster, and received and got person got fired, and the court said you didn't have just cause. You may not like the person, but not liking the person is not misconduct or insolence or fraud or anything horrible. So you don't like the person. Well, it's actually cheaper to break up after two months than it is to fire somebody after two months because this person bought a compensation package of nine months. Why? Because there have been unwritten promises of security, and also they had lured this person from a secure place of employment. They could have avoided this problem by putting in a probationary period in writing, or at least negotiated a divorce clause up front that they would have to live with, both of them, because that would mean you wouldn't have to come and talk to me. Or if you did, it would be for an hour and not for days and days and days in a stale courtroom in, in Brampton. How much notice of resignation do you want? If this person's going to walk, what do you need? Do you need two weeks? Do you need a month? Do you need two months? And are you really going to be happy having this person with you when you know he's really he or she really is out the door? So you have to think about what you want for notice of resignation. You need to think about if this person has a ownership interest, what happens to the ownership interest if they're no longer an employee. And it, it can be not just shares, it can be sort of quasi-equity arrangements that I won't get into detail. And you need to think about what this person can or cannot do after they leave you. So one of the things you want is a real confidentiality agreement. Now somebody asked about non-competition agreements, so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on it since it came up earlier in the session. Essentially, we have a broad category called restrict restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants restrict somebody from doing certain things, both during the course of their employment, but also afterwards. After their employment ends, a restrictive covenant is only enforced in Ontario, and in fact much of Canada, if it is reasonable between the parties and not contrary to public policy. 
And it has been crystal clear in the courts in the last two decades that a pure non-competition clause, thou shalt not be in the business of um, assisting, and there's somebody here in the solar camp, Solar industry, it, assisting industries, uh, so the solar industry. Thou shalt not be in the business of women's hair care products, which another person is here. Even if you try to make it really, really narrow, it is unlikely to be enforced unless this person was really a co founder. So a thou shalt not be in an industry clause is hard to get enforced. You can try to put it in. You can try to justify it on the basis that they're key employees, co-founders, develop intellectual property or the public face of it. Now, if I were trying to get that from Bill Gates or you know, Steve Wozniak, I might be able to get it and get it enforced because they are the, they are or were the face of the companies at the time. But if it's essentially your CFO, CTO, CEO even, a complete prohibition is hard to enforce. What you can get you should really focus on is non-solicitation of employees and non-solicitation of customers. So if you can protect your employees and protect your customers, you've got about 75%. And remember, you can get confidentiality. So if you're developing something that's new and unique, even if it isn't really a patentable device, maybe it's a process, you may be able to get confidentiality protections of health care. Confidentiality, which includes non-disclosure agreements with third-party businesses or non-disclosure agreements with your own employees or consultants, are protected. But what you can't do is say, thou shalt never work in the legal industry for a period of 12 or 24 months, or um, thou shalt not be involved in the hair care industry or in the medical supply business devices. So you can't keep people from working in an industry that they've chosen to work in, except in extreme narrow circumstances. And the exception, that is ge the general exception, is if any of you were to develop a company, and you had, let's say, four or five shareholders, and I came and bought that company, and I paid a fair price for it, or, you know, at, at arm's length, decent price, you can be assured that I will want a covenant from each and every one of you saying, you are not going back into this industry for five or 10 years, because what I paid for is the goodwill, the know-how, and, and that unique market position you have created. And what I don't want is the day after I hand you a multi-million dollar check for you to go and, you know, and you know, create the second company. You know, I just don't want you to do that. That when in a business context, things are enforceable, but in an employment context, a post-employment restrictive covenant, okay, which is the thou shalt not work in this industry, or thou shalt not solicit my customers, or thou shalt not cons cons um, solicit my employees, are looked at very carefully. And in general, in Ontario, non-competition, pure stay out of my sandbox clauses, as I call them, are not enforceable. But keep your paws off my customers, keep your paws off my employees, if they're drafted well, can be made enforceable, and sometimes that's where you get your protection. Ellen? Can I ask, um, how much does fiduciary duty play a role in protecting? Uh, okay, so the question was fiduciary duty. So a fiduciary duty, if fiduciary is an officer of a corporation, usually a C-level officer, where they are of such strategic importance to the company that law will imply for a very short period of time, a duty not to not to solicit customers and clients. You do, but the duty of confidentiality, even though we always put it in writing, is one that applies from everybody from the receptionist at the front desk to the mailroom clerk to the chief executive officer to the chairman of the board. So everybody has because confidential information is like property. It belongs to the company or the employer. But customers, employees, not so much. Reg, you had a question. Yes. Um, where does the assignment of copyright come into play? Okay. In Next slide or two slides over. Good. I like people who do that. That's a hint that I should keep moving on. Um, okay. How am I doing for time, Lily? Okay. <coughs> 
They'll stretch the session. If you have eye or a problem stretching the session, I'll, okay, I'll question in the back. Quick. Paul? Real quick question. I want you to know my name. Uh, <clears throat> customers, how, do you define prospective customers as customers or prospects as separate from okay. customers? Okay, so we're not getting into the nitty gritty of drafting a, a non competition or restrictive custom, and it's how much can you protect prospective customers. So the first principle of drafting is uh, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. And what that means is the more you try to protect, the greater risk there is that the court will not enforce it. So I say aim for 95% protection, do not aim for 105% protection. Because no one's perfect, no one's going to draft something at 100%. So what about prospects? There are very complicated precedents in this office that go in and sort of define what is a realistic prospect that the employee has touched, where they have worked really hard, you know, they've done market intelligence, they've had somebody like Helen in her earlier incarnation, or Rebecca in an earlier incarnation, do all that research to put together a pitch to maybe meet with the person. That probably could be defined as a prospect. Uh, but the person that you, you know, network with at a tie event and exchange B cards with, you know, probably you're going to lose. So you really want to work with a lawyer who drafts this on a daily basis to make sure that you're protecting no more than what you can justify in a court of law. But the answer is yes, you can protect prospects if you define it tightly. Okay, was there another question in the back? It's going to move on otherwise. So you said employment cannot be challenged. So why lawyers are again and again putting on their contracts? I I'm see not sure I understand the question. See the employment, uh, the, the solicitation, you cannot... No, no, a, a non-solicitation agreement, so thou shalt keep your paws off my customers, thou shalt keep your paws off my employees is enforceable in Ontario. What is not enforceable in Ontario, unless you're like a Bill Gates or uh, a Steve Jobs, is the you will never work in this industry again or you can't work in this industry for 12 months. Because our courts, from and I actually researched this, there's a decision from 1638 which says, it is contrary to the common wheel of the nation to restrict learned and skilled men from plying their trade for the greater good of the common wheel. Okay? And I've actually modernized the English. That's 1638, there's even earlier decisions and otherwise, we don't want smart, innovative, entrepreneurial people sitting at home with their uh, you know, hands uh, underneath their anatomy because we want them working, paying taxes, because believe me, they don't knew how to pay taxes back then. So that's it. Now, what you can do, if you're, you, and this is not a startup exercise, this is for a much more mature organization, you can pay people, you can say, we will pay you certain amounts of money if you sit, and the person then has to choose whether taking your money, okay, or not. But they can choose not to take your money and still compete. So let's say you offer somebody $100,000 uh, to sit for 12 months, but they get an offer for $200,000 to work for your competitors. They can choose to work for your competitors. They can't steal your employees. They can't steal your customers if you've written a proper contract. They can't give you confidential information but they can be just as bright and brilliant in your competitor's business as they were for you. All right, so we were talking about intellectual property assignment agreements and where that sort of fell into the whole stuff. And I see this with a lot of startups, especially young startups. They really do work collaboratively in a very open sourcing kind of arrangement. And you'll often see, you know, there's a great um, weekends where you can go and bring your idea and share it with people and they can work on your idea and you can work on theirs and you come out after that weekend with you know, a much different sort of uh, business plan than you had, maybe even a different product than you went in with. But what happens when you've got some intellectual property? Who owns that idea? What's stopping the person who knows about your idea? except perhaps money, from stealing your idea and developing it themselves. Now, if you're at Coca-Cola and you've got this secret formula for Coke, what you have is trade secret protection and licensing and, and copyright. You have all these legal structures that you are prepared to defend in court 
in order to protect the secret sauce, the secret formula. But what happens when you haven't set it up right? What happens if you really never thought about who owns the idea? Is it, you know, George and Jane and Adam and Bob who were sitting together around the table, not dissimilar from what we have here, who came up with the great idea? Do they individually own it? And what happens when all four of them develop a company? Is it the company that owns the idea, or is it still the four individuals? And then when those four individuals share it with the next four members of the dream team, who owns the idea, especially when the next members of the dream team make version one better into version two? Well, you better know that, because when you come to an investor, they are going to want to know you own your intellectual property. They don't want to buy a nice name on a corporation that somebody incorporated for 500 bucks. They want to know that your intellectual property belongs to you. And so you need an agreement. And you yourself, as a person who developed this baby, you have to sign an agreement with respect to intellectual property, giving your baby to a corporation, because that's typically how we structure things in this province. So you need to deal with ownership of IP, and your employment agreements really need to think about um, asking people who are going to work on your ideas, the version two, the version three, they need to transfer and assign that intellectual property to the company. You need to think about copyright issues. If you're in software, you have a copyright issue rather than a patent issue. And people have something, you know, like typically if you're paying them, typically under the Copyright Act, it's implicit that the company or the employer owns it. I don't like implicit stuff because what I find with startups, they didn't really pay as regularly as they should have, and the agreement was in oral, and uh, well, you know, they were an independent contractor and an employee, but they were really an employee, but we did do CPP and EI, and we never gave them vacation, and we never gave them staff holiday pay, so we treated them like a contractor. By that time, I'm thinking, oh God, I just, I'm tired. Let's just have a copyright assignment agreement a waiver of moral rights in Canada. People have a right to be associated with their intellectual creations or artistic creations. You, that may be great. Like if you've got a, a great doctor who's developed something, you may want them to be associated with the product. But on the other hand, you may not. You may want it to belong cleanly to your corporation. And so you need to sort of get a waiver of moral rights. Now for those of you who go to the Eaton Center, best moral rights case in Canada are the geese that are in the Eaton Center, those really beautiful ones way up high. And one cra um, uh, Christmas, Cadillac Fairview thought it would be a great idea to decorate them with red ribbons. I actually thought it was very pretty. The artist who created the geese thought it was a insensitive and demeaning thing that kind of took away from his vision of how the geese should fly in the Eaton Center. And so he asserted his moral rights. So one of his moral rights is to the artistic integrity of a work. So, you want to waive for moral rights, usually. You may want to figure out what happens if they're not going to cooperate. You might want that uh, irrevocable powers of attorney so that you can sign certain documents for them. You may want to make it clear that they have an obligation to cooperate even after they left. And then, you know, we talk about non-competes and non-solicits. And one other thing I like is I want them to tell future employers of the intellectual property agreement so that future employers are put on notice that this person has certain restrictions that they're obliged to honor and the new employer is bound to respect. And if they fail to respect it, that the new employer can also be on the hook. Applies to you guys too. You hire some hotshot from some hotshot high tech company. You can't ask that person to divulge confidential information. You can't ask that person, hey, you know, what customers were they going after? Or who was their contact in such and such? What was their pricing on such and such? Um, you know, uh, did they develop a solution or workaround to this problem that you can share with us? You can't do that because you are asking them to breach their duty of confidentiality. And if you're taking on some hotshot who used to work at some big company, I can assure you some hotshot lawyers can come after you and make your life miserable, which would really be a nightmare and you don't want to go into nightmares. Okay. So question, question about the debt seekers. Yeah. So if, uh, for example, taking the example of Coke, and I'm a brilliant chemist, and I'm able to figure out what they are doing, and make a copy of Coke, am I breaking the law? Okay, it depends. It's a very complex issue. The, the idea is reverse engineering. Yeah. 
In some contexts, reverse engineering can be a violation of the copyright or patent. In other cases, if it's a trade secret, it may not be. So it really, I'd have to know more, but the issue, the, re, the reality is you want to have a lawyer look at the situation and say whether or not you're entitled to reverse engineer and then replicate something. So it depends how it's been protected. Because in fact, if it's patented, it is in fact a violation of the patent, I can tell you that. It just, it is, because that's the whole point of patent is you disclose to the world, so it makes it easy for people to reverse engineer, quite frankly, because you get the full disclosure through the patent system. And so, uh, but you've got this exclusivity that is recognized by law. A lot of companies actually refuse to patent uh, materials that are patentable because they don't want the world to know 10 years or 20 years or 30 years of them, how did they do it? And they rely on trade secrets. So if you can figure it out, God bless you. Okay? Yeah? Uh, I, I would like to warn, give, give you guys some warning that if you try to, as an employer, you try to hold every intellectual property right of your own, and uh, you may lose uh, your employees' hearty cooperation, especially the moral right. And right. Uh, one example is, as I mentioned earlier, is the broke of the team that invented transistor. transistor. Yeah. Right. So the, the point was made is that just because you can insist on owning everything, you should decide whether that's the way you want to do something because you may actually um, either scare away people because they don't want to work with you. It's not really team things, like I own everything, you own nothing. Um, or it may actually have people that you have there say, we're not working with you, we're walking. And that goes back to the slide I showed you before, adios amigos, I'm out of here. In other words, this is not what I signed up for, this is not my unwritten expectation of how this dream is going to unfold, I'm going to pursue my dream elsewhere. And an example of what has worked very successfully um, is uh, the University of Waterloo, who among many of its predecessor universities chose not to assert the right of intellectual property ownership on their professors' intellectual property developments, and to the contrary, encouraged them to try to commercialize them or find partners who could commercialize it. And I firmly believe that is why the University of Waterloo, which is a baby university, it's you know, just over 50 years old compared to the world's oldest universities, which are over 1,000 years old. It's why that baby university has done so well, because it chose to liberate its employees to pursue dreams of their own and to do it in a way that was still compatible with pursuing academic excellence. So it's an example of how you can build a team that's great by being willing to share. Isn't so, this intellectual property a very tenuous area? I mean, it's hard to define where and how uh, the ownership should be? Uh, it can be, but if you do it ahead of time, it's much less difficult. And that's why it is. If you have four people around the table develop an idea, each will truthfully say they contributed something to making a great idea. And they will each claim ownership rights. So, but what, ha what I'm saying to you is think about those <coughs> issues ahead of time. So when you're looking to onboard people, think about how you want to deal with intellectual property rights. So for, what, for example, one great model is the company or the employer owns all the intellectual property rights, but they actually are very generous in terms of sharing shares or ownership. You know, they have a very robust employee share option purchase plan. And they do that because, yes, we know that we're leveraging your um, intellectual property, we have the capital and know-how how to do it, but we are also going to share the great wealth that we're creating because of it. So that's one model. But you've got to talk to your lawyer about what model works best in your industry and give them what your dream is. And lots of dreams don't involve intellectual property. Like, that's the other thing. I mean, in this firm, we think about everything in terms of intellectual property because we're one of the oldest and best intellectual property firms in the country. But there's lots of great businesses out there who essentially, because they build a great team, because they have a better way of approaching a problem, um, do very well. I mean, Helen does extremely well. She's extremely well known in our community. Um, it's not because she has a lot of intellectual property and moral rights and copyright. It's because she has a unique value proposition that she 
that God gives to her customers, and we appreciate it, and then we prefer business, and so on and so on. So a lot of great businesses are not intellectual property kind of. I mean, if you think about retail, a lot of retail, I mean, is branding. There's, there is intellectual property there. There's copyright there. But, you know, why do people go to Walmart rather than Costco rather than Target? There's often not as much intellectual property in that. They leverage other people's intellectual property. There's lots of great retail software and marketing software and all of that, but they have a value proposition that they give to their customers. So we talk about intellectual property. It isn't always the only way of creating value in your company, but you need to think about it, not ignore it, so that you're not visiting expensive intellectual property litigation lawyers afterwards to say he took the baby with him and he's competing. Shareholders agreements. As a startup, maybe, maybe if you're one person, but at some point in time you're going to have team members. And one of the ways you can attract great team members, including experienced team members, not just young people, is offering them a chance to own something. If I work for corporate Canada, if I work for the government, I do not own anything. I'm not building something for myself. I cannot say this is my company the same way I can if I'm a shareholder. And so one of the things that small companies often do is really work on employee shareholder plans of some sort. And you need to have a shareholder agreement in order to do that properly. You might want to have different classes of shares which reflect the different kinds of contributions. You might want to have uh, shareholders agreements that envision what happens when an investor comes in. I mean, there's probably, there's a whole month's course that you can do on shareholders agreements when you're a lawyer, and I'm not going to do that in the five minutes I've got left to me. But what I'm saying is, having a good shareholders agreement now is a good idea. If you think you're going to bring people in, and you're going to actually give them some kind of equity to incentivize them to come to you rather than go to an established company, then make sure that you have a shareholders agreement. And shareholders agreements evolve and change over time. I'm working with a very mature company that I'm on their sixth unanimous and restated shareholders agreement. So it's not like it's cast in stone, but the idea is they started with something, then they wanted to change it because they wanted different classes of shares and different kinds of people to get different kinds of share ownership, and they kept changing it as they grew. But they thought about it from day one. Okay, this is a true story. <coughs> We were just talking. It, all right, so here is Danny and I had lots of chats in the early days about him earning equity if things worked out. I needed some of the help of marketing. I think I might have mentioned five or ten percent. It was all day, pie in the sky thing, beers at the afternoon patio thing. Danny was a dud. Johnny had to finish off everything he started. We fired Danny. We gave him the notice you put in the agreement. What's his problem? What do you mean he's claiming ten percent of the company? It wasn't in writing. We didn't agree on it. That's like virtually, well, yes, it actually, it, yeah. Uh, Helen was saying that this could be virtually a script from Mark Zuckerberg in the Facebook movie, which whose name I've forgotten, I apologize. But actually, no, this is a much smaller company uh, that I work with where I'm telling them I've got a statement of claim. So the, the scenario worked in, there's an employment agreement, it mentioned nothing about shares, because they didn't tell me that there had been this patio conversation, so I didn't put it in. There was a formula, so when they said, we want to terminate Danny, I wrote a lovely termination letter, we made sure we paid him to the penny, everything we promised him, and we thought we were great, okay? Then I get a statement of claim saying he owns 10% of the equity in the company, which I can assure you was worth a lot more in 2011 than it was worth in 2002 when Danny and the boys started the company on a patio. Okay? Danny is not popular, but Danny wants his 10%. We were just talking. Well, oral agreements are enforceable, and if it was reasonable for this person to believe he was getting 10% if he joined the company at a lesser wage, which is what his proposition was, you know, I was a University of Waterloo grad, and the economy was good back then, I had lots of job offers, I wanted to build something, I had ownership in, we never got around to doing paperwork, but I always knew I had 10%, okay? And the court enforced the verbal promise because there were emails that suggest that Danny Boy was right in thinking that he was going to get an equity stake in the company, right? So, point of the story is... Don't, you know, those, those conversations that you have on a sunny afternoon in a patio 
are in the first one. The last thing I want to do is I hate neutralizing that. All accountants and all lawyers are the same, you know? And you know, they're too expensive, they don't know what they're doing, they don't understand our industry, and I think, you know what, that's not the same. It's like finding the proper family position. It does take time. And my advice to you is all lawyers and accounts are not the same. Don't go to your cousin's family lawyer or your brother's you know, accountant that does his taxes. Find somebody who knows your industry, that understands the stresses of working with startups. And good advice is sometimes you know, a little bit more expensive than you know, bad advice, but it's usually better. You do get what you pay for. So I don't know if that's what you were expecting from me, Lalith, but that's kind of all I've prepared, but I'm happy to take questions. Okay, question back. Uh, what are technology uh, entrepreneur or startup? Uh, what are some of the must dos if they are hiring uh, the first employees? Uh, is, are there uh, you know guidance or ready made packages available which can guide them in this process? You know what? It, it's actually I mean you can go on the internet and there are other people, but I would say if it went to, if you're going to start employee one, I say this to, I don't care if you're a tech startup or if you're just uh, a pizza franchise, you have an employment agreement in writing and you pay attention to the divorce terms. It's like having a prenup. And you know, when you all love each other and you're passionate and you're looking forward to the marriage, it's much easier to get a pre prenup signed and negotiated than when you hate each other because you've done each other wrong. So that is like that's number one. Number two is if you really are a tech company and there is some intellectual property, stick in a confidentiality and a ownership of IP agreement. It may not be your eight-page agreement that you'll be required to sign when you get your first VC funding, but at least it proves who owns what and that it was discussed in the beginning. And those agreements, just so you know, are not outrageously expensive. Like it's probably a five hundred to fifteen hundred dollar exercise from start to finish to get a template. Now that template, it that's like any other template. It's off the rack, it's not perfect, but it will at least do 90%. What you do not do is you do not do what one of my clients did, where they went on to find law, found what looked like a great agreement, stuck it in front of the employee, the employee dutifully signed it, and it did not protect them in one iota because templates are great, but you need to know which templates you need, and that takes a little bit of skill. So that's what I would say. Okay. What about uh, if you're hiring somebody on contract? You do the same thing. Okay, this is a great one, and I should have stuck it in my slides, so I didn't. A lot of people say, well, why do I care? They're all independent contractors. Independent contractors own their own intellectual property. It may be implied that they give you the right to use their intellectual property, but they own their intellectual property. So here you have got a great you know, <clears throat> contractor, and he's... I don't know, worked around a horrible software design problem you've been having, and you're gonna incorporate it into your software solution, and you're gonna go market to it, and you don't even own the nifty little fix that he just fixed for you. This is not a good thing. If that person were an employee, I would have an argument that we owned it because by virtue of common law, there's an implied you know, assignment. He's an independent contractor, he owns it. So what we do is we do an independent contract agreement. And again, you'll see language about the assignment of IP that is virtually identical to the language you would see in an employment agreement. I think, Nina, you just answered my question on using independent contractors. Each one assigns a non-disclosure and a assignment of copyright. Rich has been listening to me, it makes me happy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but the question, because it did come up, that that is legitimate for dealing with independent contractors. It's you know, basically as not the same <coughs> strength as if I were to do that with an employee. In general, if it's drafted the way it should have been drafted, it's perfectly enforceable to say as a condition of me paying you and you getting to do this work as an independent contractor, I own this property. You know, that's not necessary. I mean, this, ha this happens in very sophisticated workplaces. So if you think about architects who work for large retail corporations, you know, the big box store. Well, architects own the copyright in their design. So technically speaking, every, you know, you know, every time Walmart wants to build another identical Walmart down the 401, 
they would have to go to the architect. So they worked out agreements. The architect may be an independent con contractor, but they've assigned the rights to that design and improvements to that design um, to Walmart or name another big box solution that you want to talk about. So this happens in very sophisticated settings. There's nothing wrong with that. Tony? Yes. Um, um, I was thinking about when you had mentioned about when you're sitting on the patio having a couple beers and you're having this great conversation and all the stuff is coming up about the company. And so when does it actually, you said that it becomes um, enforceable, the verbal agreement becomes enforceable. Does it become enforceable at that time or once the work starts happening? Okay, so this is like a law school question. When was the contract formed? Uh, was it formed on the patio when they were drinking beers, or did it form when the, the you know people started working? And most likely the answer would be when when you saw an exchange. In other words, the person started working for the company, and the company hired uh, the employee to do um, the, be their chief marketing officer. And there are plenty of agreements which are partially in writing and partially you know oral. So you want to be careful about that. So I'm not discouraging you from brainstorming, but what I think that Danny, boy, Danny and the boys should have done, when they all loved each other, is written it down. Like, just really written it down. And, and you know, if, if the deal was he was gonna get 10%, write it down so that we don't have expensive litigation, because I can assure you, however charming you may think I am, spending days with me in an airless courtroom is really a nightmare. And it's an expensive nightmare. I am an expensive date. My colleagues in my industry are expensive dates. You do not want to spend time with me in litigation. You much prefer to spend time with me ahead of time when we're drafting and creating the template as to how you move forward. Right. Yeah. My question is, uh, if you're having a corporate company and you're building a board of advisors, do you have to sign any agreement or? Yes, okay, so that's a great question. Lots of startups in our industry, and Helen knows it, because uh, Helen often uh, helps put them together, do not have boards of directors, because directors don't want to take on that personal liability for employees and remittances and this and that. But they have a board of advisors. And the question was, you know, should we have a written agreement? And my my recommendation is that you do have a uh, written agreement. Sometimes boards of advisors are really doing it, it very much the way Thai Trevor members are doing it. We're doing it because we want to give back. We're not really expecting an ownership interest in the company. We're not expecting um, even you know, formal recognition. We're doing it because we think it's the right thing to do. But other people have an expectation that when the company is able, that they will get paid, they'll get shares. So I really think you should have a simple agreement and really important in that agreement is to reaffirm the values of confidentiality and the assignment of intellectual property rights. Uh, can the email be regarded as an <coughs> agreement? Can you do agreement? an agreement by email? Absolutely. Just like you can have an oral agreement, which can be proven by evidence under oath, emails, are, emails and texts are now probably my number one source of evidence regarding what the parties intended. So absolutely, uh, you know, if I sent you an email saying I want to hire you, and here are all the business terms, right? Mm -hmm. And not even a PDF, just a pure email, and you say, great, Nina, I agree, uh, I'll be there uh, Tuesday morning um, at 8.30, a court will infer an enforceable agreement from that. So. Just it raises, I know that Lolita's we'll trying to get rid of me, so I'll be very quick. Um, the, <laughs> you just tell me when to shut up. How's that? Is that fair? Um, uh, what I tell people is that it's really important to watch those emails because a court may say that you did so much by email that the written agreement that your brilliant lawyer drafted for you came as an afterthought. And if it came as an afterthought, it's not enforceable because the oral deal or the email deal arguably was a complete deal, and then you tried to change the rules of the game by presenting a written document that had never been discussed. So if you're gonna do a lot of work by email, a very good trick is to say, look, you know, obviously there's lots of legal terms and conditions we have to agree upon. Here's a draft of our template, but here's how I see this working out. You know, you'll start on Tuesday, you'll be this, you'll do that, okay? So at least you have some protection that you put the idea of a written legal template 
right up front in your negotiations. Okay. Or at least before he shows up Tuesday morning at 8.30 with coffee. So going back to the contractors that you mentioned before, assuming you said that a contractor has his own IP rights, basically, even if he's doing a job for me, and even if we sign an agreement? No, if you sign an agreement that assigns the intellectual property to the company, that is appropriately worded, then the company owns intellectual property. But if it's just a contractor and there is, you know, a person, if there's a purchase order or an index, <coughs> the only paperwork you see, and you'll see something like, you know, um, 24 hours of software development at a rate of $80 an hour, and that's the only paper that exists, then it's arguable the independent contractor owns the intellectual property. So why get into that argument? Create a standard form purchase order or create a standard form of independent contract agreement that deals with it so there's no misunderstandings later. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the contractor basically gave a mutual NDA. We signed that, for instance, and he could have closed that unless you pay your balance, basically the IP rights are mine. Can you do that? I'd have to read the agreement, actually. But you know what? Do you really want to like you know fight that one? Why don't you just you know like seriously? I mean, no, I mean, is it legal? I mean, is it? Oh, absolutely, because he actually owns the intellectual. The mutual NDA says whatever I you tell me, I will keep confidential. Whatever I tell you, you'll keep confidential. That's what a mutual non-disclosure. Your secrets are going to be kept. My secrets are going to be kept. He then develops something himself that you want. You haven't paid for it. So there may be a very good argument that he wasn't going to give those intellectual properties to you until he got payment. So without going into like a lot of details, which I think we should take offline, the reality is, the short version is, have a clear-cut agreement so that it's not an issue later on. Uh, so when it comes to compensation for employment, where, which is not monetary, uh, is there, can a court like judge determine determine if uh, the the payment that was promised is sufficient. Uh, like how, how does that happen? Okay, so in general, the question is sufficiency of consideration. And, you know, I remember my first year contracts uh, professor, and there is a principle of law is that the court typically does not look at the sufficiency of consideration. It has to be legal, so it has to meet legal minimums, but it won't look at whether or not you should have paid $100,000 for this intellectual property or 80. Reg was telling me when we were doing lunch is that he thought something was worth about 80 or $100, and somebody else thought it was worth $150,000. If they did a handshake deal at $250, the court's not going to, at arm's length, the court's typically not going to go behind that, but they agreed it. Uh, the, the question was if it was not monetary, like say you just had some agreement that you're going to do this work for me and I'm going to do this for you. Uh, okay, so okay, all right, yeah. Oh, boy, this is like first year contracts. That was actually one of the questions in my first year quiz. Okay, you can have consideration that is non-monetary. So it can be something like um, I will buy you a cat if you shovel the driveway for the next 10 weeks. I mean, and that is theoretically a enforceable agreement. That's sort of an agreement that my neighbor has with their kids. But so, uh, so you can have consideration that is effectively a barter form. You know, I will, um, if you help me market my product, then I will uh, help you establish your network in the computer and I'll wire it for you. So I've seen agreements that are perfectly um, enforceable. I just wanted to understand, like, uh, at what level would, would it be considered like sufficient payment? Like, would that be arguable no, in court like, where, after the fact? Okay, where is it? Okay, in general, a barter agreement is enforceable, but where you might find problems is if a court finds that you were dealing with an employee. So we're dealing not B to B. We're dealing with the employee or independent contractor. If you're dealing with an employee and the court finds that you did not obey the minimums of the Employment Standards Act. There is a real risk that they would find that the deal to be contrary to public policy. So you really want to be careful. But in general, if one business wants to fix your car and you want to do their IT and, and they want to own your IP, they could do deals like that and it would be enforceable. Thank you. Okay? Any more questions? <coughs> Okay, so you now have three years of law school in one year. Uh, I'll stick around for a few more minutes if you have questions after the session's over. Thank you.